Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good morning, IPC Hebron. The last couple of weeks, we have been uh, having gone away from this topic. We'll come back to this topic of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For a few months now, in the past few months, we've looked at the forerunners, and last time, Brother Joe went into an overview of the birth and the early life of Jesus. So we're looking at uh, further into the birth of Jesus today. Uh, I know it's not December, uh, but the Lord has his word to speak to us. Jesus Christ, who became man to save sinners, uh, there needed to be a way that he came into the earth, and that is what we'll talk about. As a way of introduction, has anybody heard of Podunk, Oklahoma? Have you ever been to Podunk, Oklahoma? You know, when I talk to my patients, they say they're from Podunk, Oklahoma, and I thought it was a real place. I looked it up. It's more of a colloquial term used for a town that is insignificant, out of the way, or lacks importance. It's like a placeholder town, a backwater town, place of disrepute, and the closest thing in Oklahoma is uh, Poto, Oklahoma. I couldn't find a Podunk, but there is a Podunk, uh, New York, and a Podunk, Michigan, when I searched it. So it is theoretically a hypothetical place regarded typically as dull or insignificant, and that is the place where Jesus, our Savior, grew up. The name of that place is Nazareth, right? Jesus of Nazareth. And so much so that when Jesus was later calling his disciples, we see Andrew and uh, Peter called, and then we see Philip, his disciple, called. And when he tried to call his brother and say, we found the one that Moses and our scriptures have talked about and said, he is Jesus of Nazareth, the reply that Nathaniel gave is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that is our topic for today, our title. Jesus came from Nazareth and fulfilled all of the biblical prophecies of the coming Messiah, and he came from humble beginnings. Humble beginnings. From a manger to a major town, from a podunk to a slam dunk, from a small town to a world-class town, from humble beginnings to the savior of the world, from the guttermost to the uttermost. That is the story of the Bible. If you look at Corinthians, the Lord uses humble people, people that the world does not count worthy. But you look at David, and he was the runt of the litter. You look at Moses, and he had a speaking, stuttering, bumbling speech problem. We look at Ruth, the Moabitess. She was unworthy to come into the presence of, uh, of God. And we see Paul, a persecutor. And if you look throughout the Bible, you see that the word of God uses the people that you least expect to bring the greatest glory and our Savior, our Lord Jesus, is no different. Our main verse uh, that I'll read today is the annunciation of the birth of Jesus, the announcement of the birth of Jesus. Um, I know that the birth of Jesus is talked about in Luke and Matthew, and so we'll look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26 onwards. In the sixth month, Gabriel the angel was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man called Joseph. From the family of David, the virgin was called Mary. And the angel says, greetings, favored one. And when he arrived, he also said, may the Lord be with you. She was disturbed at this and wondered what such a greeting might mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, said the angel to her. You are in favor with God. Listen, you will conceive in your womb and 
uh, and he will be a son and you will call him Jesus. He will be a great man and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never come to an end. How will this happen, said Mary to the angel, I'm still a virgin. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, replied the angel, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that uh, reason, the Holy One who is born in you will be called God's Son. God's Son. Let me tell you this too. Your cousin Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son and is six months pregnant. And uh, people used to say she was barren with God. You see, nothing is impossible. And then the reply of Mary is, I am the Lord's servant girl, or I am the Lord's slave. Let it happen to me, as you said. Let it happen to me, as you said. So there's many different directions I could go, but I first wanted to show that Jesus was prophesied hundreds of years prior to his arrival on earth. Um, as a man. We know that Jesus existed before the foundation of the world as a triune God. We know in John 1, 1 that he was, he was the word. In the beginning, he was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We know that it is at the word of Jesus that everything that was created was created. And we know by him, he holds all of the universe together. But that God left his glory above and needed to come down to make a way for mankind. And that was going to be through a particular couple. And why did God choose Joseph and Mary? In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Peace, uh, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of his increase, of his government and the peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it upon it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Hundreds of years before the Lord Jesus came, we see the prophet Isaiah prophesying that there would be someone who comes in the lineage of David that he would be uh, the savior of the world, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, and there would be no end to his government. Amen. Amen. Jesus fulfilled that. In Isaiah 11 verse 1, we see that there will be a righteous reign of the branch. And we'll understand that the word branch is where the word Nazareth comes from, the branch there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. In Isaiah 11, 1 again, it is talking about the stump of Jesse, a branch, a shoot that will come out of the generation of David and that will be the savior of the world and all the qualities he'll have of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might, and knowledge. That is talking about our Lord Jesus many hundreds of years before he came. In Isaiah 53, verse 2 and 3, it says, For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah again is prophetically reminding us about our Lord Jesus and how he would come, not as a royal king, not born in a palace, but born in a stable. And he was put in a feeding trough, a manger, and then later, all of the sufferings that he would need to go through is what is prophesied about in Isaiah 53. In Micah 5 verse 2, it says specifically where he is to be born. In Micah 5 2, it says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathath, you are too little among the clans of Judah, 
But from you shall come forth to me the one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from the ancients of days. So we know that he needs to be born in Bethlehem. And actually the Jewish people thought that he would be from Jerusalem or Bethlehem, the important areas of Israel. But the Lord had different plans. He chose a man from Galilee, a uh, far off place, north part of Israel, uh, broken up by Samaria, a place that is a podunk town uh, that the Lord chose to bring down his savior uh, through Mary and Joseph. Second Samuel chapter seven says, the covenant that the Lord had with David and specifically the Nathan's prophecy that said, when your days are fulfilled, you will lie down with your fathers and I will bring your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom uh, forever. I will be with him a father and he shall be with me a son. And uh, it goes on to talk about how uh, he will be disciplined with the rod of men and the stripes of the son of men. Now, uh, this is talking about prophetically talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament prophecies that we just looked at from Isaiah and Micah, we see that Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the Savior of the world needed to come from the line of David, from as an offspring of David to reign in his uh, kingdom, his throne forever. We know that he needed to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, as we looked at in Micah 5, 2. We also see in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, it says, as the prophecies of old have said, he shall be called a Nazarene. And a Nazarene means a branch or a shoot. Uh, and uh, we'll see that he must come from a lowly place. And he needs to be born of a virgin, something that has never happened before. You know, God created Adam and Eve and it is by the seed of man, after Adam sinned, all of the mankind that was born was uh, sinful and had original sin, had sin. But here we see that if there was just another savior that was born of the seed of man, that he would have sin as well. But here the seed was provided by God himself. It was by the help of the Holy Spirit as we see and in order to do that, there needed to be a virgin. And Mary uh, and Joseph fulfilled a lot of those prophecies. If you look, and I know it's hard to see, but if you look at the genealogy of Jesus and Matthew uh, chapter 1, uh, it goes on to talk about how uh, Jesus is in the line of David. And uh, I won't go through the names, but Adam, Noah, Abraham, Specifically, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and the son of Judah, uh, Perez, is where David came from. And from one of the sons of David, we see the line of Mary. And then we also see in Luke chapter uh, 3, a reverse order. And that is thought to be the line of Joseph, the adoptive father. And so both ways, both with Mary, uh, the biological mother, and the uh, line of Joseph and Mary, we see that, there, that he was a direct descendant of Abraham and David uh, through Joseph, his legal father, and also through uh, David, uh, another son, we see Mary's lineage. So one of the prophecies became true by looking at the genealogy of Jesus. In, Mat in Matthew 2.23, as I mentioned, we see that he went and lived in a city called Nazareth and so that what was spoken of by the prophets might be fulfilled and he would be called a Nazarene. If you look in the Old Testament, other than the reference to the shoot, there's not a specific term of Nazarene and um, there is uh, some discussion among Bible scholars. It talks about the lowly estate, the podunk nature of the place he would come from, Nazarene. And I talked about how when Nathaniel was called to be a disciple, his answer when he, said, when he was said, we have found him whom 
the, that Moses and the law and the prophets wrote about Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, we see that Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Started from Nazareth, and now we're here. We see Nazareth, Netzer is the other name for it, which means a branch. And if you look at the chart here, you'll see where is Nazareth. Nazareth is a small little town that is uh, way up north, right? Uh, it is not near Jerusalem or Bethlehem. It is near uh, the Galilean region up here. And you see that it is uh, here uh, in Nazareth, right? And uh, it is not a place that would have been well known. It's a small Jewish town in the lower district of Galilee, in the northern part of Israel, somewhat about 85 miles away from Bethlehem. And Arabic uh, tradition uh, usually has people known from where they're from, right? And we know that uh, the Muslims refer to us as Nazris or Nasranis, right? And uh, those are the people who follow Jesus. And the phrase Jesus of Nazareth became used and we see in the New Testament there are in English 17 times that the name of the city that he's from, this little podunk town in north Israel that only had a few hundred people or just a few families living there, became the place where Jesus grew up. Um, it refers to the power and dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. If you look at the travels of Joseph and Mary and Jesus that you see in Luke and Matthew, I wanted to point out a few things. One is that at first, as you know, uh, he had the annunciation that Jesus would be born in Nazareth here. And we see the angel came to Mary and we read that portion. And we know that Joseph was confused and angry and upset but we see that the angel also appeared to Joseph and said, this is true, that the Holy Spirit is what ha has given the seed for this child. And so that annunciation happens in Nazareth. But as we know, there was a Roman census called and there needed to be, as Mary was pregnant, and uh, there needed to be a travel where they are going from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem, which is the town uh, that Joseph is from and we see that is when they had the baby she had the pain and they had the baby in Bethlehem so they stayed in Bethlehem uh, and at day eight we see them going to the temple in Jerusalem and we see many things around that we see two important people that are there we see Simeon and Annas, Anna the prophetess that says that this is the Messiah as well and then we see them traveling back to Bethlehem and uh, living there uh, for a little bit longer. And on day 40, we know that he again presented at the Jerusalem temple for uh, uh, the two turtle doves and the, sacra and the uh, ceremony with him being the firstborn. And he had to go back and they were staying in Bethlehem when there was the edict that all of the young men because the Magi's had, uh, because they had come and told the, the, the ruler that there was the savior of the world, the king of the Jews born, uh, there was an edict and they had to escape to Egypt. That escape was about 40 miles and uh, the angel appeared to Joseph and uh, told him that they were putting all of the boys under two to death. That is also a prophecy that is seen uh, in uh, different portions like Jeremiah, where the death of the boys is seen in Jeremiah 31, verse 15. And in Hosea 11, uh, 1 through 7, it talks about the need to flee to Egypt. And then after uh, this particular ruler had died, we see that instead of going back to Bethlehem, they go back to Nazareth, and that becomes the boyhood home of Jesus. The boyhood home of Jesus is Nazareth. And that's why he is known as uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. 
So uh, we see uh, that the prophecies that a virgin should give birth from the house of David, and he shall be known as a Nazarene, and he will be uh, born in Bethlehem, were all fulfilled in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And also we know that uh, when he was presented to the temple, there were two people waiting for him, right? There was Simeon and there was a lady who was a prophetess and a widow for 80-something years, and her name was Anna. And we could go further into it another time, but Anna means grace, and uh, uh, Simeon uh, particularly means that uh, uh, Simeon has a particular meaning as well. So what that means is the grace of the Lord uh, God has come down and uh, come down for mankind is the particular meaning behind that. We also see uh, that the angels told Mary and Joseph that he should be Emmanuel, which means God is with us, Right? But his Jewish name was Jesus. He shall save his people from their sin. And as we look into the birth of Jesus further in the next few weeks, as my time is running up, uh, we see that Jesus is Jehovah saves from our sins. Jesus is the one who saves us from our sins. Emmanuel, that means God is with us always. When God decided to send his only begotten son to save mankind, he needed a place to go. And he did not choose Jerusalem. He did not choose a palace. But he chose a small little village on the outskirts, on the northern side in Galilee. A place that you would not expect it. But where the clan of Judah had uh, immigrated to a hundred years before Christ. And there were two faithful people And we'll study that maybe more in the coming weeks about how Mary said, I am your servant. I am your slave. Imagine a young lady who is a teenager and the Lord is, uh, the, the angel is coming and saying that you'll be pregnant. What kind of disgrace, what kind of humiliation will she have to go through? But she did not count it as anything that is a disgrace. She said, Lord, let your will be done in our life. We're living in a time where there's so much identity crisis, where people are not sure what they are. But Mary was sure of what she is. And she said, Lord, I am your servant. Let your will happen in my life. Then I was thinking about Joseph and what kind of options he had. He could have uh, publicly made a shame of her or privately divorced her. Or she could have, he could have gotten married out of the three choices he chose. Initially, he was thinking about Uh, secretly divorcing her, but the, we see that the spirit, uh, the angel came to him and said, this is the Lord's child, it's the Lord's doing. And we see that Joseph decides to marry her. All the emotions that Joseph would have been going through, and in order for this prophecy to be true, we needed Joseph uh, to be in the picture as well, because the house of Joseph, uh, where the census needed to be taken, where he was from, was from uh, Bethlehem. And so all of that, all of those things work together uh, in the plan of God. And so we see so many, so many things uh, coming together. We see the wise men bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which uh, is showing the kingship and the worship and uh, the pain that he would go through. Mary would have known uh, all of the pain that He needed, she needed to go through in saying, yes, I am your Lord's servant. At 33 and a half years, the suffering that, the intense suffering she must have had gone through, the stress, the PTSD she might have had to go through knowing that her son was being hung and that his side was pierced. All of the sufferings, she said, yes, I am your Lord's servant. I am your servant. So the question still remains, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And the surprising answer is yes. When God chose to have his son, the savior of the world, he did not choose a famous place. He chose Nazareth. God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chooses the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, as we read in Corinthians. 
And we know the life of all of our Bible characters and how the Lord does his thing in a miraculous way where he does what is uh, perfect and pleasing to the Lord. The world will say that Jesus was foolish and weak and lowly, despised uh, in the estimation of their eyes. But we see that he is coming back once again, no longer as the suffering servant from Nazareth, but as the judge that will judge the world. The coming of our Lord is near, children of God. As I'm closing, I want you to, say, I want you to know that Jesus fulfilled all of the biblical prophecies as the coming Messiah, uh, and it was from humble beginnings. Jesus was born in Nazareth, maybe for many reasons. He was poor. Uh, he went through the suffering of the common man, and therefore he was able to relate with the poor, the needy. He could have been born in a palace with a silver spoon in his mouth, but that is not how Jesus was born. That is not how God chose Jesus to be born. Uh, he was born in a no-name place called Nazareth. So in your life, in your Nazareth situation, you might be saying, is there any answer? As the worship team is coming up, we can say that God can turn our disrepute into an honor. We can say that God can turn your Nazareth into good beginnings. Your setback is a propeller or a launching pad for a comeback. And Nazareth doesn't have to be your end. Even though God is a God of hum humble beginnings, he has used the lowly, he has used, used the forgotten, he has used the ignored, the unexpected, but the Messiah came out of a place like this. So if you're going through a Nazareth experience, I want to give you hope that we started from Nazareth and now we're here and the Lord Jesus is coming back to judge the world. Are you ready? May God bless you all. Amen. Can we all stand for worship?